Thank you so much for inviting me here. I uh, talked to Craig. I'm very honored to be in front of this group. Um, trails are very important. I've been a highway transportation engineer for 33 years. I also have a degree in environmental engineering and, and a while ago we started working on some trail projects and they grew into where they, they became uh, very large. This project here was $16 million when it was finished. And uh, a, lot of it, a lot of these trails need engineering. Uh, they really are kind of built like roads. They have bridges, there's retaining walls, there's tunnels, there's foundations, things like that to do. So got into this trail and I tell you, it's been one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life because my two trail projects we recently finished, including this one uh, here you'll see today, are my favorite projects of my entire career. And uh, it's just very, very rewarding. You see Facebook comments like, the trail changed my life, I lost 20 pounds, I don't need my diabetes medicine anymore. These are posts that we see on Facebook on the Ashokan Rail Trail. So I, I applaud you all for really pushing this through because it is really important. And I, I kind of reiterate the fact that we've got to get some younger people involved as well to kind of pass the torch as time goes on to keep that momentum going with getting these done. So. Okay, so let's get right into it here. This is the Ashokan Rail Trail. Uh, it's around the Ashokan Reservoir, which is a New York City water supply, Department of Environmental Protection, call them uh, New York City DEP. I'm just gonna call them DEP from now on, so that's what I'm referring to. Um, as you may expect, the water source for New York City is extremely protected. There is a New York a DEP police force. Um, ironically, the police force was formed in the early 1900s uh, because while they were actually building this project, building this dam, this reservoir, um, all of the workers lived in their own type of communities. I'll just say the Italians lived with the Italians and the, the Asians lived with the Asians and it was very segregated like you might see the ghettos in New York City, um, not being derogatory as ghettos, but kind of the groupings of people. And they would drink and fight like crazy at night. So they formed this New York City police force to handle the workers while this reservoir was being built. But now they've formed into protecting the water supply. It's about a 2,000 square mile watershed, um, about 125 miles from New York City. 40% um, of New York City's water, uh, drinking water comes through this reservoir. Um, it is called a terminal reservoir, which it goes right into the system unfiltered, and then it gets treated downstream at, uh, with various methods. But 1.2 billion gallons, and uh, the deepest depth is about 190 feet, um, but it was formed by uh, removing a lot of towns. I'll go over that in a second. Uh, and they were basically moved out. All of the homes were burned. Trees were taken out and it was inundated and flooded. In about 1910, the last lawsuit was done in 1947 from a property owner that got to, had to be re replaced. Um, you know, it does its job. It's currently going under something called a Centennial Project. It's a $1 billion uh, up, upgrade on the entire system. Our firm is doing some work on the environmental parts of that project too. Um, the main objective for this project was to create the fully accessible recreational trail um, along the or northern edge of the reservoir where there was an abandoned railroad line. Um, the 11 and a half mile section uh, was the former Ulster Delaware Railroad. Uh, it had been 40 years since trains had run on this section of track. It was leased to a uh, company a kind of a recreational type company, scenic company called the Catskill Mountain Railroad. Over the 38 year lease that they had, they did nothing in the corridor to improve the tracks. Uh, all of the ties were deteriorated. There were 30,000 that we took out. Um, they didn't do anything with it, but when it came down to uh, talking about converting it to trail, uh, that's when the battle began. Um, there's still some lawsuits going on about taking this back and putting tracks back on it. So I, I won't be able to give you a lot of information on the political part of what's going on with that because it still is in litigation. The trail was completed in 2019. So, so the project goals, uh, typical of what you'd see for a rail trail, but one of the most important things here is we did have that political support. Uh, the county executive for Ulster County in New York, Mike Hine, uh, this project was a county sponsored project and it went through three different towns um, we just had the, the towns were involved agencies to, be, to work with the county, but it was sponsored and run by the county, which I think is in contrast to what I've been hearing today that a lot of your stuff is town by town by town. So it was a little simpler to kind of group everything together uh, than what you may have in a, in a corridor like this. Um, but we had that support from the, from the town, uh, from the county, it was in their master comp plan, it was very easy to sell. 
and the New York City DEP did not want any more trains running along the water supply uh, for obvious reasons. After 9-11, uh, the police force was doubled. Uh, patrols 24 hours a day. There's two or three police officers on this corridor alone just because of its nature of being a terminal reservoir. Um, they were very worried about train, trains filled with contaminants being intentionally put into the reservoir or accidentally. Um, and uh, they just decided that it was going to be a trail. Well, that, that's when the fight also really began with the railroad company that wanted to keep it, a, a, wanted to have it as a scenic route. Um, so an agreement was made with New York City. Uh, they would allow a recreational trail. Um, they would provide two and a half million of the 16 million in funding. They would fund three trailheads on the project, uh, but they required an unpaved trail surface. Um, and they were prohibiting horses. You could bring dogs and other, if you walk your cat, I've seen that. Um, you can walk your cat, uh, you can walk your dog, but no horses on the corridor. Um, there also had, were a limited number of hunting and fishing permits uh, that were out there and uh, they wanted to make sure that was preserved. And in order to do that, um, we had to make accommodations to make sure that each of these, the hunter paths and where fishing access was maintained during construction after and afterwards. So that was an important part. So getting your agencies on board, one of the first things that we did on the feasibility study for this was to go to New York City and said, what are your major concerns? What do you need? Because a lot of them at in the regulatory agency part of that, that division, they did not want this. They didn't want people walking by. It was a nightmare for them. Uh, they didn't want it. So there's a lot of internal fighting in New York City DEP uh, of who wanted it and who didn't want it. So we had a task of, of uh, convincing the naysayers, uh, and they weren't really NIMBYs, but they were naysayers, and uh, uh, that you can trust this, it will be fine. So that was the biggest hurdle, and the first thing that you got to do with this is to find out what your, their major concerns are, come back with them a few months later with solutions, and real solutions, and then prove them and gain their trust. And that was the hardest initial part of this project, was to get past that barrier. And once we got uh, most everybody on board, there were still a few that were out there, they, they, were, um, they were still there, um, they provide devil's advocate stuff for every time, everything we went over, but... It, it, was a, it was a process to win over their trust, and that's probably one of the most important things to do first. So a little bit of the timeline. Um, the, the county executive said we got to do have a trail network, and he talked about health and well-being, um, access to grocery stores and better food for disadvantaged communities, environmental justice has come up uh, with that, and, and uh, in the city of Kingston where this is near, there's a series of network of trails. We just finished another one in the city that links a lot of this. So it's all part of a network um, connecting with the Empire State Trail. We've all heard of that. Um, but his, his backing was health and wellness, connectivity, environmental justice, and all those factors play in to help get the consensus to say, yes, we need that from the people with the funds. And a lot of these check the boxes on the funding in New York State, at least, um, that to get money for the projects. Um, so back legislation 2015, uh, they authorized the project design. Uh, we came on board in 2016 uh, and then construction started 18 months later. So we had 18 months to design this project and get everything in, in, in order. So I'm gonna give you a quick run through. Uh, these are just some slides at the beginning of the corridor. They'll, I'm gonna go fast, so pretend you're walking on the trail. Get an idea of what the corridor looked like. Keep in mind all these waterways, they would play a major factor with the environmental work on, on the project. See up here? That was unique. <laughs> this is a, a wetland that we, uh, we did a wetland avoidance. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So it's very steep slopes, uh, one on 1.5 for those of you who know uh, what, what that means. Uh, it's just very steep. Um, this is the, the 300 foot uh, bridge that got washed out from Irene and Lee in 2011. Uh, this is what's called the Esopus Creek. It's the, kind of the main artery for uh, 
for water supply into, into this system and where some of the other uh, reservoirs in the, in the system that are more north in the Catskills drain into that Esopus Creek as well. That all flows into this reservoir where I said, told you it was a terminal reservoir. Other reservoirs flow into it, then it goes directly into the piping system that heads down to New York City. Just a nice picture of the Glenford Dyke with the trail across the top of it. Um, a number of these dikes. And built as a picture from 1916 when it was first initially built. So um, the dikes, part of the reservoir system, of course, very important. They're small dams. And uh, we had to be very careful uh, and document everything and make sure the, any loading um, and, and there was no disturbance, no change in elevation on, on that. So working with them, it was kind of one of their, uh, their critical points to make sure the trail didn't disturb anything with the water supply system. So, and this is kind of balancing the uses. All the fishing, the cross country skiing, um, the New York City DEP was very interested in promoting to their customers, where does your water come from? And letting them know, you need to conserve it, you don't waste it, this is where it's coming from, this is why it's important when you're visiting these areas to keep it clean. So their marketing campaign on preserving the water but also, also utilizing its recreational resources with respect was a big factor in them moving forward with this because they can utilize it to help people better be more personally manage their own activities when they're near the water. So uh, that, was, that was very important to them. Um, this is just a little bit of the, the fishing areas and that with the reservoir, but how, how big it is. I can skip through this a little bit. Lots of wildlife here. These are all tracks in one location. That's a bear. Um, this tortoise, he was not very happy and uh, it snapped a little bit here and there. So we kind of let him have his way. Um, there are eagle, lots of eagle nests out there and there's a, a mama bear and her cub that I stopped short and we took that picture, but we were like moving backwards while we were taking the photo. So it's a, a little bit blurry, so I apologize for that. But. And then, you know, while the equipment was out there, uh, the wildlife didn't seem to have too much of a problem with it. I'm standing here with my phone, and here they come. And I showed this to the regulators at DEP. I said, look, we're, the wildlife, they're already okay with it. We're out there, it's beginning of construction, and you've got, you've got them still here. And just to reiterate and reinstate that we really do care about the environment and the natural habitat. And again, confidence and, and believability and, and saying you're going to do what you're going to do. A little bit of, of the uh, skiing. So the communities that were displaced um, here, 32 cemeteries, the 2,800 remains re uh, um, relocated. The communities of West Hurley, Ashton, Glenford, all these towns here were all moved out. All of the uh, homes were burned, the trees were taken down, um, and the place was flooded, and this took about 10 years for it to happen. This community here, this is what it used to look like. It's all underwater right now. And then when you're on the trail, this is a shot from the trail. Here are the, the rock walls that separated people's properties, and it's very popular in the Hudson Valley for these stone walls to be everywhere. And if you notice these trees, they're all the same diameter. This was cleared, this area did not get flooded, but the homes and properties were taken out, but then the trees all grew back and they notice how similar the diameters are all about the same age. So, so this is, a, we have a uh, interpretive plaque right here with the communities displaced and, and identifying a lot of these things on the plaque for people that walk by and here it is right here, so. The dike construction um, back in 1910 um, so I, I mentioned to a few people, I have, did this presentation for New York State DOT uh, a few months ago at a statewide conference, so I have a few uh, highway state DOT jokes in here. So I, I, I left them in because maybe somebody will get them. But, um, so the construction of this, what's amazing, this whole corridor was built by hand. And these are pictures from 1915 of some of the access roads that were built around it. Um, and this is a very important historical photo in that it's all the work's being done by hand, but this is when the, the, uh, the first inspector came on board to watch the work being done from his car um, and not doing any of the work himself. But the next picture, a few weeks later, the, the consultant world of engineers got involved and we had a lot more inspectors out there on the job. So the, uh, the guys at DOT love that one. So anyway, done very differently than it would be today. The first uh, DEP police force, 
uh, break up the fights in all of the communities, uh, at, you know, at, uh, at last call. They do have some bikes and they do go on the trail network. Yes, they do. Um, and some of the worker camps. So these were the worker camps and they were very, uh, very segregated, uh, primarily because of language. Uh, a lot of people came to this job to work, all that work done by hand kind of stayed together because of, of language, but they did it in the universal language of throwing fists and alcohol. So, um, and then the, uh, the speed law came in in 1915. Uh, this guy, I, the caption of this is, he got pulled over for doing seven and a five. <laughs> I, that's it. So that's when the police started getting vehicles here. And uh, my favorite judge from my favorite movie, uh, my cousin Vinny, uh, right there. So uh, yes, so they like that too. Okay, so all kidding aside. Uh, design considerations, I won't read them all to you here, but um, number one, you see, protection of uh, users and the water supply. And uh, New York City wanted to make sure that that was up there first, and we always accommodated that. So, but environmentally responsible design, very important. Construction staging, this, you saw how narrow the corridor was. All right, now try backing up a, a dump truck to bring material in or take material out. Some of the access points were two and a half to three miles from each other. So you'd have to go in, dump the truck, and then drive out backwards for two and a half miles and stay within a 14 foot, 15 foot width because that was the limit of disturbance that we had negotiated with uh, New York City. So, and accessibility. We had to make sure this was ADA compliant. Um, being that it was a railroad corridor, we have about a half to three quarters of a percent maximum grade. So uh, for the, as far as grade is concerned, ADA uh, accommodations were fine. Uh, but it was the surface uh, that we had to really work on. And uh, DEP, New York City, did not want asphalt. Um, they also did not consider porous asphalt as being porous. Uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation says porous asphalt is porous, um, but New York City DEP says porous asphalt is not porous. They, have, they don't believe it yet. So that's, it still stays that way today. So I don't know, just another side thing, being with road construction, I developed the heavy duty porous asphalt for New York State and, and the country actually. And I go around the country doing trainings on it all over, the, uh, all over doing for agencies and things like that. So I love porous asphalt, it, it is great. Um, it works great with trails. Um, and if you build it right, it, it doesn't have to be vacuumed as much as a parking lot would. Um, with the trail design, it can run off the edge. If you get a section that does become clogged, it runs off the edge, and then if you build the stone courses correctly underneath and design it, it goes into there and does its infiltration anyway. Um, so it's not a, much of a maintenance headache, especially with leaf litter, um, which you'll see too, uh, that people worry about. So um, the traction on, on uh, porous asphalt, it only loses about 25% of its friction when it's wet. Conventional asphalt will lose about 75% of its friction when it's wet. So slipping and falling down grades, porous asphalt, it'll hold its grip even when it's raining much, much better. So there's a lot of benefits to it, but it is expensive. And it would have required bringing in uh, a paver and loads and loads and loads of material. And that's something that we worked out with DEP that we didn't want a lot of truck traffic going in and out. So what we did was we balanced the earthwork uh, along the whole project. So we literally had nothing taking out in earthwork and only the trail surface being brought in. Um, so that was an important part of the uh, engineering analysis. So we did cross sections every five feet to determine all of the quantities that would be there and made sure it was balanced in the corridor. So, you know, that, that was another thing that they, they liked. Okay, you really care. You're working with us. You're minimizing the, the risk of impact. That's the stuff that got this project uh, agreed upon and done so quickly through DEP. So it's a major part of any design. Corridor geometry, some of the basic standard design criteria, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but um, we had multiple different sections. You saw that in the photos, but you know, over, over this 2,000 feet, we had seven different types of cross sections that, of how it was to be built and dealing with the drainage of that and dealing with the water impacts. So that is part of the reason why we had to look at this every five, even some, at the most 10 feet sometimes for cross sections and build it that way over 11 and a half miles. And I'm kind of a little old school with that. So my staff that was uh, doing this cross-section work, they wanted to do it on the computer and I wouldn't let them. 
Um, you could print it out and they'd have to work through it. And, and I had to buy a lot of lunches over a course of about three months and because uh, they were kind of annoyed they wanted to use the computer but they really knew what they were doing when they did it by hand so I think that's that's a big big important part too so real quick different sections that would apply here um, this this is a uh, your, your typical section we had about six and a half miles half the trail would fit into this category here a 12-foot trail um, the shoulder area here um, sometimes shoulders are, are paved or sewn sometimes they're grass um, we had to go with a 12-foot maximum trail, so uh, it was built this way. But I'm going to get into the top and the base stone gradations a little bit later when I talk about surfaces. But soft surfaces, we developed a specialized surface for this project. And what I have over here is a sample of it, so you can look at it. And then if anybody wants to look, these are, you've heard of the sieves and gradations and things like that. Well, this is what they really look like. Like, it, it's on the number 40 sieve. Who knows what that means? Okay, yeah, so that's the size of the stone. And it's easy to understand three-eighths. Three-eighths of an inch is a little bit larger. But this is the mix. This is the main part, the clay. And this top course that we did has about 10 to 12% of this very fine material that's kind of a clay. And we actually molded an ashtray in memory of elementary school. Um, with this stuff in, in the office to make sure that it bound, bound together. It's a, it's a specialized gradation. You'll see in a second um, what, that, what that does. So a little bit more with steep slopes, um, typical steep slope. What we did is we lowered the trail, made it wider. We took off two feet to get us 24. When you go back with the two on one, because we couldn't fill, we go back to this. We weren't about to put, bring material in here to fill this. Some of these areas were 40 feet high. And then you take out all the vegetation, take out all the trees, take the canopy out, then you got erosion. So um, what we did was we took off the top two feet, which gave us a wider base. That material went in the stockpile because there was another area by the bridge we needed to raise the seven feet. So that's how that material got used and balanced in, in, the, in, the, in the corridor. Um, just some typical engineering sections, but that's what it, lo what it looked like when the, the uh, base course was put down. It's kind of wide and it looks a little wide right now, but um, uh, the, uh, there was railing that went in through there, and you know, that's the final condition right there. But that's a way that you can balance your earthwork and minimize impact. We had a lot of rock cuts as well. Those were pretty cool, but they always had water in them. And um, the New York City considered every drop of water in this corridor was uh, a wetland to them, uh, a vernial pool, um, some type of, they uh, found organisms that I never even heard of when they went out there and I identified something and I, I, I don't see it, but it's swimming right there. Okay, so it was okay, I understand, and we do need to protect the environment, but um, they were on it all the time, every single day. And, and it, it was good because they trusted us and we, we made accommodations, but um, it, some of the county officials uh, would get very frustrated and uh, we had to send them home and just work with the DEP moving forward and how to avoid these types of impacts, like this. So this would be the existing condition. This is when the tracks and the ties are removed. Um, this is the stone that we used. And what would happen here is they did not want to lose continuity between this side and this side with the water. Okay. But you can see the tracks are five feet wide you know, how are you going to get a 12-foot trail without getting into the water? So, um, took the, the ties and the tracks came out. That's another process. And these are the stones that I use in the porous asphalt design. And they're about an inch and a half to three inches in size. They're, every single one of them is, through, is crushed through the crusher. Then it's washed. And that's about as much as of the stone dust you can get off it. When they lock together, there's a 40 to 45% air void ratio. So if you took a cubic yard of that stone, 40% of it would be air. Okay, so the water goes right through it. And that's how we use it to store the water in the reservoir course as a porous asphalt. So what we did is we built this up with that stone, put our trail surface course, built it up, and now the water can flow from here under and to here and back and forth, and back and forth. And they loved it. Let us, let us do it. So we moved through with that in a lot of different locations. You know, and that's what it looked like with the, the base course installed. And the base course is uh, another mixture of uh, that stone and another, another gradation. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the top course went right on top of it. So 
This top course, um, you can barely see in here some of the larger stone. It's not stone dust. The larger stone, the pieces that are in it provide the structural integrity on it. What happens when it gets wet, the clay swells and then it locks it together and then the larger stone that's intermixed in here kind of locks into that clay and stays there. It doesn't rut and it does not get displaced when it's wet. Um, then when it dries out, it loosens up and gets soft again. And it, we've got a million visitors on the trail. It's been open for four years and since December of 2019. Um, and it has not been groomed yet. Not once. And no ruts have been filled, nothing like that at all. They, DEP put goats on one of the dikes to eat the poison ivy. And the goats started pawing at the side of the trail through the fence. So we had a little erosion there, but that doesn't really count. I wasn't happy about that, but. So the base course here consists of those same larger porous asphalt stones and then a mixture of regular road subbase, 50-50 split. And we use that, that mixture because there was ballast that was there that we could leave in place. Now the ballast was full of fragments of the railroad ties and there of course were creosote. Um, we did hazardous materials testing throughout the corridor, found some of the areas where they, some maintenance was done as some fuel, but we were able to cap everything. Um, when the ties were taken out, we, uh, they, they were pulled out with kind of a fork and a rake, a fork rake system and put into a truck and they were recycled and they, they were burned in one of the last incinerating plants downstate of New York where you can actually do that for fuel. But we, we also had remnants and pieces because a lot of the ties just completely disintegrated. So we didn't want to take that ballast out. Now you have to deal with that waste. So let's leave it in there. New York State DEC agreed from the levels that were in there, we could cap it. So we had to bridge the gap between a, a smooth trail surface like this. Imagine putting that right on top of ballast. You'd, it'd be gone the, the first year. Um, so we had to find something intermediate. So we developed this course based on the ballast that was there. That gradation here can change depending on what size ballast you have as every trail ballast can be very can be different or you have a different situation so that's something that whatever engineering firms that you work with um, you know try to make sure that they, they they're compatible with what's left and what you put on there so soft surfaces can work all right and then we had some centerline shifts so so trail width um, one of the most important things that a uh, big argument that we had this took three meetings and months and months is convincing New York City that um, when you have a 12 foot or 10 foot trail, the base of it has to be a little wider to support it. <laughs> so they wanted, uh, well, you said it was a 12 foot trail. Why are, we, why are we disturbed 16 feet wide? And I had to do these trapezoids, put them on the screen and, and convince the regulators who weren't really the engineers uh, that this is how it had to be built. And the situation that took a while, it was a little difficult, but we got through it. They finally understood it. They didn't like it. Um, and we had to negotiate some of the sections down to 10 feet that they thought were very uh, sensitive, the real sensitive areas. But um, another thing that they, they didn't want to uh, eliminate all that vegetation along the side of the trail. I said, it very much will grow back. It will grow back with all the natural plants that are already out there. Um, we've got uh, we have a very open graded stone below. We got 40, 45% air voids. In fact, that mixture of the base is about 30% air voids. We've got plenty of place for roots. We've got moisture. We've got everything you need. And then we'll have soil eventually when the f leaves fall off the trees after the first year. And uh, one of the regulators said to me, bullshit. Sorry, can I say that here? Okay. <laughs> I said, no, it really will. And he got mad and he was yelling at me, told me to go something to myself and got in the car with the other regulator, the other two guys, and they left. And, and then a year later, I sent him this photo, and he, he didn't respond, but, um, but this is what happened. So the, the width, this is about nine or 10 feet, and it's 12, but the leaf litter here is now forming soil. And if you go out there today, um, and this is the next year, the green's starting to come back on those slopes where that extra width was done. So it's just a matter of convincing them how it will return back to what they're looking for and that natural look. So, Important. Wetland avoidance. Okay, so we had two state regulated wetlands in the corridor too. We had a um, either go around them or we had to mitigate them and replace them two to one or three to one uh, for some of the forested areas that had grown up. And we decided that we would avoid one and then we would go above one. 
Um, so this is the one section here, it was about 525 feet long. There was a long six month battle between environmental and regulatory in New York City about whether to leave the tracks and ties or to take them out. Regulatory wanted the ties out, environmental wanted to leave it alone. So eventually, in, um, regulatory won. Um, we took the, track, took the tracks out, um, and this is a bypass. You know, this red line's a bypass. We went around, up and around it, and that's kind of up, up here. You can see where the bypass was. So the tracks came out, and then this was allowed to grow back and be restored, and we have a nice uh, plaque right in front of it. The second one was a lot more difficult. It was about a 500-foot section, and it was wetlands on both sides. So we decided that um, we needed to cost, we cost two and a half million dollars if we, if we built the trail right through it and then had to create wetlands off site. Um, New York City would not let us take non-wetlands on the project site and create wetlands because they wanted limited disturbance. They wouldn't let us go off the corridor of the track. So we would have had to take the mitigation off site for two and a half, we probably would have ended up at three and a half, how those things go with wetland restoration. But um, we decided, let's build a boardwalk. Let's build something over it. That cost estimate came out to be about a million dollars. And all the county was not really happy about that. They, we tried to uh, work with Army Corps. And uh, you know, they, first, they didn't want to let us do the boardwalk. So we, we told them how we were going to construct it by not actually being in the wetland when it was built. Only footprints, no machines. So once we went through that, they said, OK, let's do it. So just an aerial view of the finished, finished product. But no, we started at one end, built it strong enough to support an excavator, turned around and pounded these in, and then they, we built the next section and built it all the way through the wetland, 525 feet long. Okay. So the county, it came at 1.1 million from the bid price. The company came from Florida to build it. They brought their whole crew up, lived, lived in the hotel, uh, good for economic development, right, um, for about two and a half months while they built this. Just a little bit more of that. We didn't realize how important this area was to the bird watching community. Every, from spring to fall, five days a week, there's a group out here from all the different, different groups from Audubon doing bird watching. And this boardwalk now is a destination point on this trail. People park at the middle trailhead so they can go, do, go on this boardwalk. And the county, at first it was a, a big pain in the neck and they weren't happy. Uh, and now it's, a, it's an attraction. So take something that is a burden on a project, work through it and make it a positive on the project. And it's been copied a few times already now on some of the other trails in New York. So um, and it's just gorgeous. That's a, a drone view. Um, and it really just looks like we weren't even there just the, that the boardwalk is there. So it's pretty, pretty neat. It's really my favorite part of the project. Uh, real quick on tree removal, 90% 90, 90 of the trees removed were diseased or dead ash trees. We all know about, the, about that with the bore, ash borer. Um, but we took out 3,050 trees <laughs> on there. So um, culverts, I'll skip through these. We had uh, 55, 56 culverts in varying states of uh, um, Damaged, being damaged, and we restoration, repairs, replacement on some of them. Um, and we had a, a stonemason come in with that uh, could actually do real work with his hands and made some of the uh, replications of what was out there that was destroyed. Um, fencing. Fencing comes up on trails all the time, right? The DEP wanted to keep everybody away from the water, so their initial um, fencing requests included 18,000 feet of fencing. So. Yeah, I heard, a, I heard a couple of scoffs over there. Yeah, that was expensive. Uh, for the bid, $815,000, it would have been based on the bid prices. Um, when we final quantity, we got down to $4,300. Um, because we, we explained to them how the steep slopes, uh, some of the signs we put, beware of the Ebola ticks along the thing, the, the man-eating grasshopper, brain-eating amoebas, all the stuff, I'm just kidding. But um, how people would not go down to the water. Um, also, we thought of the trees as a, as a type of a rail also in some locations where you had just short spurts of steep areas. So we were able to get that fencing down. It was $200,000 in fencing on the project from 800. So, um, but um, split rail fencing and more of the areas where it was less of a risk 
Um, and, and then we have this type of uh, pressure treated wood fence because the trees never stop falling in this corridor. So when you open up and take the dead trees out, now you're taking away the cover for some of the ones that were just hanging on. And in the beginning, the first couple of years, the trees would fall. And lately, there's been pretty big windstorms through the area, the lower Hudson Valley and through Kingston, West Point. You probably heard about the flooding and all that. Um, but they're taking a toll and knocking those tree trees down. So the County Department of Public Works is a maintenance thing. Let's use readily available materials so we can stop on the way if we have to and get the wood we need to go fix it. Not some type of special, uh, special wood, uh, like even cedar is getting a little bit difficult to, to find. Um, nothing like that, uh, so it was very common. So some of the requests, and that's just what the more uh, robust sections of fence look like where you have steep slopes. Um, we just had one, two, couple property owners, so we didn't have the not in my backyards here. There were, these were the only two houses that were really on the corridor. And as long as we gave them a nice, some shrubs here, and uh, we gave them some fencing over here, we used the old box wire that the railroad used to use to mimic that, um, they were happy. Um, so we got lucky on that. But the, the big culvert, this culvert here um, started falling apart in the 80s and really took its toll in uh, August 2011 with Irene and Lee, and it's completely collapsed. Um, it had blocked the fish passage the, the fr slab on the downstream side dropped and the trout that, that couldn't get upstream and the fish couldn't get back and forth upstream on, out here since the 80s. Um, and this used to be a wide open area and it had a mill there that they made buttermilk at right, right in this location that was, of course was long gone. But this washout here was pretty significant. So um, we had a couple of alternatives here was to either replace the culvert in kind which will require a massive amount of concrete and foundation in there, uh, daylight it, uh, replace it with a similar type. Um, we had a couple of uh, renderings that showed we wanted to do, but we also said to the DEC, what would you like to see here? Uh, right now you have a problem with fish passage. We can fix that with this. So we went to them showing them this. We'll open the whole thing back up, daylight it back up, put the slopes back in, put a beautiful bridge up here, put a plaque, talk about it, and get it back to the old thing. And we even know where the cobbles came from that we can put them back in here. There was a, a, a landscaping business that had the cobbles that were hogged out of this corridor in a pile in the back that had been around for 100 years. So we were able to find the original style cobbles, and they probably weren't the actual cobbles, but uh, to put them back. So New York State DEC first said, we don't want you doing anything in here. Your permitting is going to be a nightmare to coming around and saying, yes, we like it, and here's $750,000 if you do it. So they turned around and gave us money out of their water quality improvement program of three quarters of a million dollars if you open this back up and daylight it and make it like it was before. So, hold and behold, we were the heroes with the county. It was a good day. Um, and we went ahead and took the culvert out. Um, <laughs> a lot of work here, environmental stuff here, bypasses and things like that all had to get done. Um, and this is a course that I do for uh, professional development hours too, so some of the engineering stuff's filtered in here still. But here it is, op uh, building a, a new bridge high up and putting the steel down. Um, and this is how it looks from down below and uh, from a, a uh, um, drone shot. And some people having a good time right on top. But uh, you could say that, I hope we can say that this is a lot nicer looking than what, would have, what was there before or what could have been if you just replaced it in kind. Um, it's been on a number of different bridge calendars too, this, this bridge here. Um, so that worked out very well. Now the Boyceville Bridge, so it was a full-blown railroad freight bridge, 300, 300 feet long, and um, it got completely annihilated, as, as you'll see. That's what it was before it collapsed. These, are, this, these piers are, are laid on what's called cribbing. Um, anybody here ever played Jenga? Well, that's how it went all the way down to the bottom of the bed, and it got built up with interlocking pieces of wood. That's what that's sitting on, all the way down. So when the storm came through, it just kicked it right out and scoured it out and blew it right out. Um, and this, tra this collapse here, this one stayed in place, so it's some other, it's completely destroyed. Um, and taken down. So just to give you an idea of flooding, um, 
this was April 4, 2017. The, the Irene and Lee storm, there's a, there's a gauge upstream that measured the flow of water. We had 1,700 cubic feet per second. Okay. Um, in April, we had 1,200 cubic feet per second. That's what this looks like. So this is 1,200. The storm that took this out was 1,700, and it went up to the bottom of the bridge back then. So it give you a kind of a, a, a look at what that means. But the design storm flow now with new numbers and that is 2,400 feet per sec, cubic feet per second. Double what you see here is what the design was set to. And that was to, to be able to let a 50-year storm go underneath the, the bridge and a 100-year and storm just touch the bottom of the steel girders. Uh, and in order to do that, we had to raise the bridge seven feet and then take the depth of the steel and reduce that. And we had to add 60 feet of length to it also. So it went from a 300-foot bridge to a, a 360-foot bridge. 60 feet, seven feet increase. Um, Access, very difficult here. Some of the girders coming in, driven deep into the ground, nothing like what it was originally founded on, just construction photos. Um, remember I told you about that material that we kept stockpiling and instead of taking it out? It was, it was used right here because the trail raised up seven feet over an a ADA compliant 2% all the way back. That's where we used all that material to bring it up. Um, more aerial photos, but you can look how, how, uh, how secluded it is back there and isolated. Just some finished shots of it. So interesting thing, the county applied to FEMA for money to uh, re replace the bridge. Okay, FEMA, with FEMA you can uh, usually only replace in kind. If you have a 30, 30 inch culvert that, con that gets washed out and you want to put a 36 inch culvert in because it needs to pass that much more water, they'll only pay for the 30 inch culvert. You have to pay for the increase in cost to make it a 36 inch culvert. Well, that applied to the bridge too. They would only pay to put back a railroad bridge. Okay? There's no railroad going through here ever again. But they would only pay if you put back a bridge capable of handling railroad, railroad uh, freight. And that wasn't going to happen. It, the cost of that would be immense. So we said, can we spend less money and build a pedestrian bridge? No. And the frustration set in. Um, and the county almost just walked away and said, you know what, forget it, we're going to fight. And so we'll we said, hey, let's not give up on this. So we divided the project up into, th into two phases. The last phase would be this bridge, because it was going to take a long time. It took us a year and two or three months to change the scope of the funding from FEMA. Department of Homeland Security in New York helped us with that. But letters after letters after letters, they claimed it was depreciation and all these different things. We ended up getting back about $2.2 million and built a $4.5 million pedestrian bridge, but it was better than nothing. Um, so they, they would not pay for the pedestrian bridge unless the scope was changed, and it took over a year to, just to change a, a, a designation of the project. So, so have patience with that. Um, just a few more pictures of it. Um, you know, this, uh, this is painted here, so it doesn't... Um, the rust doesn't drip down onto the piers, but this is naturally rusting steel here. Kiosks and benches and all that, and um, what I want to talk about, and I'm going to pass this around, this is uh, just a piece of exhaust pipe. Um, powder coating, if it's not done right, if they do it over galvanizing, sometimes people actually think you can, galvanize, you can powder coat over galvanization. Everything I've ever had powder coated is always rusted or chipped. Uh, paint, um, paint rust, paint chips. Um, when we did a project for New York State DEC in Lake George, um, we coated everything in metal, including the bike racks, with Linex. So this is the truck, truck bed liner material. All right, I'll pass this around. And you can hit it with a hammer, hit it with a rock as much as you want, and it will not chip, and it will not crack, and you can get it any color you want. Um, all of the metal on this project, because they don't want the New York City, we told them, hey, we can also put all of our... Uh, pedestrian and bike racks and that and make sure that none of those paint chips get into the water too. Oh yeah, how can you do that? Well, I brought that to them, told them the story about the New York State DEC facility we did up in Lake George, had the commissioner of DEC call the commissioner of New York City DEP and say, yeah, that happened. Because I, I took the commissioner over to the bike rack and I took a hammer and I hit it with the, with the ribbon cutting on that project. And he started, oh, what are you doing? And I said, go ahead, you try it too. Well, it works, works really well. 
And this railing, this is the railing that you would brush up against going across this bridge, that is line X2. The truss that we have on this bridge, uh, this is not structural part of the bridge, all the structures in, in here, this is all decorative. You try to mimic a little bit of the railroad heritage that, to build into it. So that railing, that metal railing um, that you put your hand across is this same material only in brown to try to get as close to the rust color as we could to fit with the rest of the bridge. So just, the, just added touches, but again, uh, we didn't want to have a rusty uh, rail go across. We didn't want galvanizing. That would just be ugly. Uh, we couldn't powder coat or paint because they said, well, we, they were worried about paint chips. So this is what we did. And it's still, still perfect today. So um, that's trailheads, three different trailheads on the project, uh, natural boulders, uh, things like that, um, typical. Um, OK, so that's the base course. Uh, yeah, there's people enjoy, out enjoying it and having a good time. The views are beautiful out there. Um, I really suggest that you, uh, that you go. Uh, if you go on YouTube, um, well, a gentleman on YouTube, uh, if you look up Long Island Bigfoot, um, he saw Bigfoot on the trail. <laughs> this is a, a screenshot here. You can go on, you can, he'll, he'll take you through where he saw him. And he's sneaking around in the woods. And I, I'm on the floor laughing. My family's like, what's wrong with you? And he, he actually goes through this. Now, I'm not saying Bigfoot doesn't exist, but, I, but this guy was really into it. So in case you need something for some free time later, there you go. <laughs> um, I talked about construction access. In a corridor like this, that's so hard to get to. So I'm sure a lot of these sections that aren't built have that as well. Um, the access for construction vehicles is so important. And we had a lot of pushback because to New York City it was just an easier way to get to the water and, and, and contaminate it or do some terrorist act to the water. So um, we had to be very careful. Some we had to remove after the project was done, but most were left as emergency access. So you know, we told them, I said, well, it is construction access for now. It's emergency access for the workers in case somebody gets hurt. But then later when people are using the trail, um, you know, it, it, ambulances and fire have to possibly get in there for, for rescue. But then also, it, for your own police force, you have a lot more points to enter the trail to get into. Because I, I, I don't know if we could put a number to it, but every access point you took away during construction probably inflated their construction bid by 10%. Because you, know, you get remember those trucks backing up back and forth in a narrow corridor. So it was kind of a, 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 a long... Um, process of uh, negotiating about the access, but access is a very important part of the cost estimation of a project. Um, these railway markers are amazing. Most of them are out there. We're only missing one on the 11 miles. Um, there was some hidden uh, uh, blanks that were still here from 1906, and uh, I can't tell you where they are. Um, they're hidden somewhere, and they're, people try to steal them. But we did, we did have a missing marker, so we decided to do a detail to replace that marker. And when, once we got the bid price for doing that in the original bluestone that's out there, it was astronomical because there aren't too many people that can do that anymore. Um, and we had to abandon that idea, and uh, we went with um, wooden ones in some locations at first. But then um, the county put out a, a, a thing on their webpage, and it got spread around social media that... We're looking for mile, mile marker 17. If anybody knows where it is, no questions asked. Come and turn it in. And amazingly, this pickup truck backed into the construction yard with it on the back of the truck and dropped it off. The guy was wearing a mask, not a COVID mask, but a ski mask. I don't know anything about it. I was just told to drop this off. And it was the brother of the guy we thought had it. So, but, but the county made good on it, no questions asked. And uh, we were able to get that one back. So the wooden one never got put up. That was awesome. You guys have uh, trails where you got to remove the tracks, right? What do you do with the tracks? Do you recycle them? Maybe they're used for other lower grade railroads or lower use railroads. The tracks out here, were made with a cold form process and they were very brittle and they could not be reused and they could not be welded because of that fact, those properties that it had. So they ended up getting recycled. They ended up in, in somewhere in, in across, across the Pacific. But they did get cut up into four foot lengths. Um, and the, the thing that we had so much of it, um, there was 11 miles of track, um, it's got value to it. 
So um, part of the problem when you bid a project like that, the, the contractor says, okay, well, this is the value of it now, today. What if it's going to be next month? What about the month after that? By the time we get it out and we get rid of it, we may go down $40 a ton, $50 a ton. So they will inflate their bid price. So instead, what we did, what I did, came up with this idea to go through the AMM scrap metal price, set a basis for what it was at the time of bidding, and then put a escalation and de-escalation values into the contract. So if the value went down, the contractor would get that difference paid back to them to what the bid price was at that. But if the price went up, the contractor kept about 50, no, I'm sorry, it was 75% of that increase in value as, hey, you know, they got it, but the county also got 25% of it too. So it was a good balance, so it protected them, so it made the price come down. Some of the bids were a dollar a foot for mm -hmm. removal because they were gonna get to keep the steel and give it away. Um, you know, so, um, you know, so the way to really do that, kind of protect your prices if you just kind of know, um, you know, how to, how to deal with that part of the bidding. Steel prices are much lower now than 270 a ton for, for uh, tracks. I think it might be half of that right now. Um, track removal, this was always interesting. The, the, uh, they used this type of sled pulled with the excavator and it just yanked everything right up. And then we used a very large electromagnet on the front of a front end loader to pick up all the rest of the iron that went through. Just pulled it along and pulled it right up and separated it. And then they pulled it out into long lengths. Um, you got to use a big machine. The first machine they had out there was having a little trouble. It was too small to actually pull the sled through the spikes and through the, the plates and everything. So you got to use a big machine. So that was the first day of track removal. So here they are pulled off in lengths and then they had a machine come in, uh, uh, kind of a, a shear and pinch it in four foot lengths. It's worth almost double in four foot lengths than it is in eight foot lengths because it can fit into the, the melting uh, smelters where you can't fit an eight foot piece. All right, so, oh, here are the goats I told you about. Yeah, they do it every year. They eat the poison ivy, I mean, like, love it. They chomp on it, I, I, I'm allergic to poison ivy, so it kind of bothers me. So here's a little bit of the project timeline. The 16th, environmental assessments began, and we opened it in uh, 2019 in December. So uh, pretty quick, quick turnaround on there. Uh, we won a lot of awards. Um, Council of Engineering, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, National Environmental Award, things like that. So for, for me, with my 33 years, I've done you know, multi-roundabout projects, interchanges and all that, but this project here trumps them all. Sorry for that word if anybody gets offended. Um, it, it, it's uh, my favorite project of my career because the, of the comments I mentioned earlier that people did. Um, yeah, we were right after we opened, we got Trail of the Month uh, in uh, Rails to Trails, National Trail of the Month, the first month we were open. So that was pretty cool. You know, that's it. I have some time for some questions. Yes, sir. How does that surface react to a uh, road bike tire that's like 23 centimeters and run 120 pounds per square inch? Yep, a lot of people ride their road bikes right on it. Yep. The key to that, if you're using a real skinny, high-pressure road bike tire, is to stay in, the, in the, uh, the path that's been compacted a little more than the rest. If you're on anything else, a hybrid tire, and you just go wherever you want. Um, but, yeah, it holds up. Anybody here at Minnewaska State Park or the Mohonk, Mohonk House and the trails? In 2010, we uh, did the uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance panel. I was in charge of that project of how to restore all of those carriage roads. We're going back to putting the large boulders in and building it back up. And we had come up with a surface that was the precursor of this one for Minnewaska and Mohonk Preserve. Um, Lucy Rockefeller, a good friend of Carol Ash, who was the, the commissioner of parks at the time, um, hired us to do the entire Rockefeller estate in Tarrytown for their roads. And we put the same surface down there. We had a contractor that refused to put it down. And the state parks uh, at the time let them do something else. It washed away. Um, came back, we got the right material, and now it's fine after the storms. It, it holds up really well to, to rain and to, the, to that. And you had two questions? Tree roots and, uh, no frost even, zero, none. No tree roots. Remember all those air voids in the base stone? No frost, no, no capillary action. The water comes up. When it expands, uh, it just fills in those voids, any ice that's in there. It's the same, same as porous asphalt. 
um, when it, there's no frost heaves in porous asphalt if it's done right with, with high air void stone. And that's why there's zero, nothing. Yep, question? Um, so is this really, at the end of the day, the impervious surface because of all that clay in there? Does the water just go right off <coughs> the edges? Or is it actually perfect? If you have your typical storm, uh, so in New York, it's uh, the 90% rainfall. In this area, it's about 1.2 inches in, in 24 hours. Um, that will infiltrate through the stone. But if you have an intense storm where you have one inch in an hour, it's going to run off. What we have, though, is we have that high air void stone right underneath it. It goes off the edge and goes right back under and does the job it's supposed to do. So if it was an impervious surface, it would probably do the same thing. Do get exactly. It just takes a different route to get there. Okay. Yep, that's the beauty of it. Yes? What was the material? Locust. We had originally thought it was going to be the helical that you could screw into the ground and they resist, but the, the contractor came back with an alternate plan. They wanted to, to drive them. Okay. So over four years that it's been open. Right now, there, I think there is a little bit too much of the larger 3-8 uh, stone sitting on top. And it's time to run a screen over it. Okay. And the county's going to do that in the spring. So it's about four or five years. Yep. Yep, and, and that's totally expected, but to tie a, tie a screen behind a, a, a quad, it, it's a DPW worker's dream, right? <laughs> to be out there and do that there. So yeah, that does, but, but again, they haven't, they haven't done that in the four years it's been open. If they had done it, say, every two years, that we wouldn't have some of the larger stone that we have up there like we do now. So, but yes? I'm a baker. Do you literally mix it together? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the quarry plant a uh, pile, another pile, front end loader picks up a pile, puts it here, takes another one, does it, and makes one pile out of the two piles, and then mixes it up one more time, puts it in the truck, goes in the truck, gets to the site, it gets dumped in a storage pile, okay, then it gets picked up again by another loader when they're ready to use it, so the mixing process is part of the handling moving process, yes. And yeah, it was something else because uh, we had, we put our inspector at the quarry the first time they were doing the mixing to make sure it was going according to plan. And the quarry and the contractor were very cooperative uh, to make sure it was done right because anything that came to the site that wasn't mixed, it, it got rejected. You know, a big X painted on it and they had to come back and the contractor would have to come back and remix it. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. Well, no. I, I got to stand here, and I, I'm, I please don't think I'm lying. Um, no. And the, the New York City DEP people were there every single day um, and looking at that. And the contractor and um, the, the controls that we put in, the processes, really protected that. Now, I'm not going to say uh, some of the stone didn't fall off and fall into the, little, uh, the stream that was there and make a little cloud. Yeah, that had to happen. I didn't see it, but I'm sure it did. But overall, this, all this water eventually runs into the water supply. So um, they, we they got one violation from them through the whole construction of the project. And it was because the contractor's employees kept leaving their keys in the equipment. So the police would come by at night and take the keys. They would look for the keys. They were hiding them under, under the engine cover and up underneath with magnets, and they still found them and took them. So that was the only really thing. They didn't want kids getting on the machine or something going into the reservoir with them. You know, change of things have happened. But, but no, the water quality stuff was very important, very carefully done. Um, and all those streams that we had eventually went into uh, down slopes, wooded areas that were flat. When they got flatter, we would make sure they outlet it, went through the forest floor, and went for, uh, it, you know, completely into sheet flow into the forest that was all around it, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Any opportunities to extend the trail in either direction? Yes, we're working on it right now. So there's a, there was a feasibility study that uh, the same guy, the, the same cup crew that we did this project uh, called the Shandaken Trail, and it's at Bel Air Ski Mountain. It's about 18, 20 miles west of this location. Um, it's easy pickings for funding right now, and it's five and a half miles. It's got five bridges on it. And it's going to connect the network of mountain biking trails and cross-country ski trails. And be, that's got federal money. And they, want, they initially wanted to pull the money because we weren't planning on paving it with asphalt. So we invited them out to the Ashokan, talked to them about it, convinced them that um, 
the snow needs to stay on, on the trail. They wanted us to plow it too. So we got out of the asphalt because we can we proved that it was ADA compliant without the asphalt. And then they wanted it to be plowed because it had federal funds and we convinced them that people with, with uh, uh, physical disabilities still like to cross country ski and we would be taking that away from them if we plowed it. And they bought it. And now we're, we're designing it right now for a soft surface. And that piece, there's another piece from that, at the beginning of this that goes into the city of Kingston that's being looked at right now. The Open Space Institute is working on that. Um, we just finished the Kingston Rail Trail, which connects downtown to the O&W Trail, which is almost making that network. There's one piece to connect the end of this to the city of Kingston and the Empire State Trail. So it, it's building and it's building. Um, but the best thing about it is once you get it going, the momentum, you gotta, you gotta keep on the momentum with the funding, so. Wasn't that a great question to end on? Yeah. You're welcome.